Hi, this is uh, Wednesday, um, October the 23rd, and like I said in the Prof's Notes last week, I would do a video uh, this week on the 23rd, and um, I thought we'd focus on two or three things today. Um, first and foremost is the uh, project assignment number one, which is posted out there on Blackboard and is due November the 8th. It is in this assignment where um, you will uh, speak to your research question and any hypothesis or hypotheses that you might have. Um, and I'll come back and talk about that in a minute. Um, it assumes, of course, that you have a topic out there. <laughs> and we've talked about putting a topic together, and that's what those uh, the profs notes were meant to stimulate a week or so ago, and the syllabus has spoken to this as well, or speaks to it. Um, I put a discussion thread on Blackboard earlier this morning uh, to encourage you to begin talking about what kind of topics, uh, what are the topics you have for your uh, qualitative proposal, and um, talk, uh, talk in collegial ways among yourselves in discussion, and I'll enter into the discussion as well. Um, how you would specify the research question and um, and hypotheses. So um, this video then is to kind of walk us through some of that and uh, some reference points not only from the notes but my own thinking about this but also from uh, the two texts, Moustakis as well as Creswell and um, Clark. Now the assignments that you've had, the practice assignments, are critical to this whole thing. Um, one of them, of course, was the method itself, Transcendental Phenomenological Method, and that is the epoche and the Transcendental Reduction and the Imaginative Variation, where the practice was to disabuse yourself of any sort of framework you see for interpreting the world, and basically in the epoche and the reduction, see the world as if it were for the first time. Not an easy thing to do, and not a thing that perhaps any of us can do entirely, but it's a good practice to do it uh, in order for us to be able to, in qualitative methods, in order for us to remove any framework of interpretation or preconception that we have so that we can listen to the voice of the others, our co-researchers as we call them in Moustakas, uh lingo. Um, so that's an important thing. And the uh, doing the reduction, focusing on that particular thing, and then um, and doing the imaginative variation about exactly what this is all about. Now as we move forward with the uh, project, uh, we want to do that too. We want to we want to be able to listen to the co-researchers that are the subjects of your project. So we want to do the epoche to disabuse ourselves of anything that we think might be going on, say it's people going through um, dialysis or maybe people going through bereavement uh, on some life issue or first responders, emergency responders, whatever the theme is of interest to you, that we're listening to them and focusing on them in the reduction. Um, and then the imaginative variation will not be so much in this case ones that we our own imagination that will vary until we come to the theme that we think best describes it. But the imaginative variation will be something that will be in the voice itself. How do the people that are inside this phenomenon see what's going on? How do they see it? So whereas we, we would epoche and do the reduction in order to listen to their imaginative variation, I think is a way to think about this. Now remember, um, two key terms that we want to continue even in the proposal uh, because it's part of the conceptualization of the phenom phenomenological method and that's the noesis and the uh, noema. The phenomenon that we are seeing, if it is a group of people in bereavement, then that is a noema. Uh, people inside that that are forming it, that group, uh, they uh, have their own perspective, their noesis about how this works. You're from the outside looking at it. So what they see from the inside out is the horizon. And there are some critical explanations of that sort of thing 
and um, I made a note here, but I don't think I put the page number down. Uh, no, I think it's on page 95, and I'll address that in a minute. And then hori horizontalization on page 122 in, in chapter 6. I want to talk a little bit about chapter 6 here in a minute. From the inside the, of the noema, formed by the, noe the combined noe noeses of these individuals, is uh, the horizon. From the outside, it is a boundary for us because we're not in bereavement. We're trying to understand the voice of those who are. So it's an important distinction, and the very imaginary variation will be our listening to them in this case. Um, so, but it was good practice. Uh, that's why we did it. Um, uh, the ethnomethodological one uh, assignment, uh, practice assignment, which I think was number two, was to create an awareness in us that a lot of reality is based on assumptions. Uh, that were really, you know, that it works because we all agree that it does. Uh, sometimes it formally works because we got stop signs and green lights and directions, signage out there that helps us out there in the world. But a lot of it is just our own seeing how it works and understanding how it works through socialization and other things that happen as we grow up. We understand how the social dynamics of reality works, and so we just do it in our everydayness. But it's important as qualitative researchers and practitioners to be aware of the assumptions that, uh, in a sort of a, a critical thinking way. And I think uh, ethno ethno methodology is about that because you can practice it, uh, bringing those assumptions to the fore by breaching intentionally or maybe inadvertently breaching. We've talked about line behavior and, and that sort of thing. Say that's a noema about what how people do form the phenomenon of lines uh, you know uh, somebody uh, cuts in front of you well then that's a breach so and we have to remember ethnomethodologically speaking that if you go into the west side of San Antonio or you go to the first responders and you begin talking to them or particularly the bereavers then you're breaching it uh, you're creating a ethnomethodological event or potentially. They might not have been emotionally and tearful until you, they had come to some terms with that and then you come in and you start asking them questions and they break down in front of you. Um, ethical issues here which we'll talk about later in the semester when you develop your proposal as you begin into the developing that, maybe assignment two I think, uh, project assignment two. So uh, we need to be aware as qualitative researchers that there are assumptions that build that noema in which these co-researchers are residing or are experiencing and that to the extent that we're not careful when we begin having these conversations we want to be careful that we're not breachers uh, but that we are listeners so it's an important distinction and that's what that assignment was about now the one on observation participant and non-participant observation is really more about um, identifying noema uh, observing groups and being able to tell what the horizon is, what the in, uh, particularly drawing it out in a sociogram, um, that sort of captures uh, quantitatively the internal dynamic of a noema from the outside or the inside as a participant. Um, so that was really about observing noema, uh, being able to recognize them as such, and being able to describe them richly as qualitative methodologists do so that the rich description um, is something that is so vivid that uh, an external reader would be able to see it as in italics, italicized seeing. So all three of those had an important piece to them uh, that uh, were not only right in their own way but uh, contributed to uh, the ideas of developing uh, the proposal. The fourth one which we I said the other day we're not going to do separately but we'll incorporate it in some way in the uh, proposal is dramaturgy and um, it's not that life is dramatic although of course it is but and it's not that we manipulate by playing roles and that's our thing but of course we do uh, some of these are formal roles some of them are informal roles I'm a teacher you're a student uh, I'm a father I have a daughter uh, I'm a I'm a lover I have a close friend and all that kind of stuff some of these are very um, uh, uh, personal primary and some of them are secondary. I'm sitting here with a coat and tie on. This is a secondary role you and I have. But if uh, 
you know, maybe out in the world I've got some friends, and that's a primary role. I might be in a coat and tie anyway, but probably not. And uh, that's a primary. But there are roles with that, roles related to being a father or a, a you know, a, a boyfriend or something along that line. These are roles we play, and they're not heavily scripted. Uh, more formal ones are, like perhaps teacher. There are some rules and regulations about things that you and I can do together and things that we cannot do together. So some of them are more formally scripted. But dramaturgy is about, as an interviewer, from the perspective of an interviewer, when you start setting up your interview guide for your co-researchers to talk to them about your topic, you might think of yourself as a playwright. You're sort of scripting it by putting the interview together. Um, you're a stagehand and all that because you're sort of setting the stage uh, where you want this to happen, in their place, your place, at a coffee shop, however you want to do that. Um, and you're doing what you can to establish a rapport, to uh, ensure a, a successful dialogue. Um, so think of dramaturgy as sort of setting the stage and being the stage manager not in a manipulative way, but uh, being the stage manager for your interview that will uh, create a, a successful environment for good interaction between you and the co-researcher. And we'll fold dramaturgy in to the proposal rather than doing it um, separately. So all four of these are key uh, development pieces to um, the uh, project. Now, I want to I want to point out uh, something here on page uh, 95. Uh, a major process is, I think this is, I'm not sure what chapter this is, chapter 5, where Moustakis is talking about phenomenological reduction. There are two things here I think that are important uh, to keep in mind, sort of theoretically, conceptually. One is the issue of horizons. We already spoke about that. Um, in a sense, when you see uh, others and you don't know what's going on, that's a horizon, perhaps, that you're trying to cross. Um, I prefer to think of it as a boundary that you've got to make permeable. They may see it as a horizon because they don't recognize you. Um, but uh, horizon is important, and I think it's useful to distinguish horizon from the inside looking out and a boundary, the same thing, but a boundary from the outside looking in. We have to permeate that boundary in a way that is conducive to listening to the voice, to enabling people to speak to us. So look at the horizon concept on that. It's about the second chap uh, paragraph down. The other one is, in the third paragraph, it begins, um, I guess it's about three quarters of the way down. Um, in phenomenological reduction, we return to the self. We experience things that exist in the world from the vantage point of self-awareness, self-reflection, and self-knowledge. So when we think of the reduction, in a sense, um, it is a focus on self. Um, we're aware, creating an awareness of what we see um, in that whereas before we might have just blown right through it, assumed we saw what we saw, and not only really think about how and not really be in any reflective way, but in an everydayness way we just see it, interpret it, and keep on going, and we may have missed the point of the whole thing. So it focuses on us in a sense that we become aware of ourself looking at this, as though we are the lens looking at this. But not to get that, trying to, through the epouge, not to make that lens sort of through a lens darkly, shall we say, an interpretive lens from our own perspective and noe uh, noesis, but from the standpoint of the other. So I think that's an important thing to think about. We're not completely getting rid of ourselves, but we're sharpening our perspective, realizing that um, how powerful we are, unintentionally perhaps, in influencing others, and that we should relax and see who we are and see what, how we develop that relationship, be aware of what we do. Okay, that's an important thing, I think, um, to keep in mind. Um, let's take a look at uh, Chapter 6. Um, there are some key points there I want to point out to you. Um, the research question in any research, whether it's qualitative or quantitative, is the essential primary thing. If you don't have a good question, you don't know where to go next. Uh, think of it as a, as a machete when you're out in the jungle. You want a good, sharp question in order to move your way, manipulate, hack your way through all of the data, all of the information, all that's out there, and get a good path. So you need to have a research question that's very clear to you, for sure, 
but also clear to anyone else who you would have a conversation. You have to be able to say what it is in a reasonable way for others to be able to understand. Now, it is, um, I point out here on page 104 uh, under the methods of preparation. Uh, all we're doing for assignment, project assignment one, is the, is the research question and hypotheses. And we'll just focus on that now, and we'll do a video in another week, uh, maybe after, maybe next week as we get as eight, the eighth, or get closer to the eighth, to set up the next assignment. Um, so we're kind of building the proposal piece by piece. Um, that methods of preparation, look at the formulating the question. Um, there are... Uh, some interesting commentary there. You buy about a half a page at the bottom of that and the top of page 105. Um, the question stated in clear and concrete terms, well of course that's obvious, but is to arrive at a topic in question that have both social meaning and personal significance. So um, you want this something to be of interest to you, a personal significance. Let's just say for example a student some years ago had a son who was an emergency responder first responder in um, Houston and uh, it was personally significant to her and it had of course social meaning uh, because of the value of personal or emergency responders so um, make it make that connection that it has personal meaning to you personal significance in some way um, perhaps you've gone through bereavement and you want to understand bereavement uh, better or something um, but then bereavement itself has social meaning. Um, there are others in our lives just like that are breathing even though we're not. And if we're present to those then we are affected by that. And if we're not affected by that when they are present to us we ought to be. So uh, make that connection between social meaning and, um, and, and personal significance. Um, at the top of the page 105 you'll see five points there. Look at those. Uh, they're critical. Uh, we're looking at essences and meanings of human experience. We're not doing a quantitative study. We're extrapolating to a population. We're doing a quantitative study of uh, a thousand people in a survey. We'll recast this project this fall into a quantitative study in the next course, 6316. But right now, uh, the context is small. Uh, the sample size, we talk about that, I'll just go ahead and say it, might be one person to maybe five, six, not more than twelve, where you can explore in depth uh, the meaning of this, uh, this topic that you have in mind. Uh, we're not trying to quantify it in any way, we're trying to explore it in depth from the standpoint of the individuals involved, listening to how their imaginative variation constructs that and, listens, and we listen to it. We want to uncover the qualitative rather than the quantitative factors. That's number two. Um, engages the total self of the research uh, participant. That's why they call them co-researchers in, elsewhere in the book. They are co-researchers. They're involved in this just like you are. You are involved because you are there. And so that's why we have to be mindful of how we are there so that we don't change how everybody else is there. We don't want to go in there. We're not counselors. We're listeners. So we want to be able to see it, if I may say it, in its pristine uh, moment, expression, uninfluenced by us as best we can do that. Uh, we don't, we're not looking into predicting or determining causal relationships, which brings me to the point of a hypothesis. I would dare say, in a bold way, the qualitative studies do not have hypotheses. They have research questions. They're exploring issues and then um, sort of from the ground, grounded theoretically. There are no theory really, maybe in some of these things we don't know uh, how to explain the topic at this point. But um, so we go in there, if we have hypotheses, you have to think, if we know what a causal relationship is as we go in, then we've got, that's a grid. Because, oh yes, I'm going in there, I know what causes this to happen, we don't want to do that because then everybody talks about what we think are the causes and not what they think are the causes. So hypotheses are dangerous in qualitative study. You can have them out there, but uh, we don't want to have them too, at this point, too concrete, maybe some ideas, but not really forcefully formulated and certainly not uh, guides to any interview uh, where you go in there and you get justification that your way of thinking about this in terms of relationships is correct by listening to what they have to say, yes, Blanchard, you're okay, you, you got the right idea. We don't want to do that. So, but the, the question's important. Um, and um, 
Careful comprehensive descriptions, vivid and accurate renderings of the experience rather than measurements, ratings, or scores. And I think that, just take a look at those five and you'll get a sense of what we're up to in, um, in this. So um, you can look at uh, over here, um, there in, um, in chapter, later in chapter six, uh, if I get the chapter here, I'm sorry I don't have the yellow stickers here. Uh, they have uh, a place that you'll want to go. Take a look at the general interview guide on page 116. You're going to have an interview guide uh, so that you're, you're asking if you have, say, six people that you want to talk to. You might do it in a focus group or individual key informant interviews uh, so that you're asking everybody the same questions, open-ended questions. Uh, or you'll have some things you know where you want to say that they're male, female, maybe maybe ethnicity and race is interesting to you and age is interesting to you. But the the essences of the of the of the noema, shall we say, are open ended questions to allow that voice to come out and talk about the di internal dynamic. So take a look at that general interview guide. There's some very good ways in there, some good suggestions for developing a uh, interview guide for phenomenological research methods and I suggest, I recommend, I won't require, uh, but I recommend you use it. You'll find it as a way to kind of simplify your thinking, if I may put it that way, as you begin to develop your interview guide and you're going to want to have that by the time we get around to uh, mid-November uh, so that we can get all this accomplished uh, by uh, that first week in December. So uh, take a look at that. It even talks about beginning an interview. And one other place that you might look is in this is Appendix uh, um, E, I guess. If I can find it here. Maybe I went too far. Oh, Creating the Research Manuscript. No, that's not it. Um, Appendix C, Outline Summary of the Phenomenological Model. There are some uh, very important uh, aspects to what you want to do in this project. Processes, the epoche, the reduction, hor hor horizontalization, imaginative variation, uh, methodology, collecting data, organizing, and all of that. If you use that Appendix C in the laying out of your uh, proposal, you'll be right on the mark. Okay, um, let's see, I think that may be all that I want to say. I think I mentioned Creswell and Clark. Uh, if I didn't, I'll mention it now. Uh, that's the other text. We're not using it so much up to this point, but now would be a good time to look at Creswell and Clark because they come at us in qualitative methods, um, but they're very good at, since it's a mixed methods textbook, which is, these two courses together are mixed methods. This is the qualitative, qualitative side, uh, and then the more exploratory side, and then next semester, 16, uh, 16, uh, 15, 16, 16, 15, and 16, 16, I forget the numbers of the courses, but any of the quantitative side in the, in the spring is the quantitative side of the mixed methods. So these two courses together go, go together, and Creswell and Clark bridge that as the text. Uh, Moustakis is for us to get very grounded in the qualitative exploratory side of this in the building the qualitative uh, proposal. Uh, so take a look at Creswell and Clark and how they recommend um, creating uh, research questions that bridge uh, the two aspects of a mixed method. I think at this point very good to bring Creswell and Clark in and to help you uh, frame that uh, research question and begin looking at the research question, I mean uh, the literature view and things that will su be subsequent to that. Okay, um, I think that's all for uh, now that I can see on my notes. Um, so uh, thank you. Get into the discussion. Um, get out there, small number of you, uh, get out there in the discussion and say this is my topic. You don't have to report to me. Just get it in the discussion and I'll see it and I'll mix it in there with you. Uh, this is my topic. This is what I'm thinking about doing. This is a research question. What do you think? Is this kind of a good research question? Let's get a dynamic around, shall we call it a virtual seminar table, like the several of us and me and all of us sitting around a table. And so we were having a seminar discussion on this and that's the way we'll play this thing out over the next couple of weeks. So I look forward to seeing you in um, discussion, and um, thanks a lot. And uh, not sure whether I'll do a video next week.
probably it's probably good at this point as we at the last half as we begin working to get that proposal down I should do a video every week just so we got some eye contact shall we say so uh, you take care and uh, I'll see you in discussion eh